does he do? He might go all the way. He gives it a wide. It's a chance. It'll be a goal. Two times, half the luck. You know, this time the Suns don't ruin our mid-season revival and they certainly don't turn our season upside down. Luke Parker was sizzling. Lizardman Nick Blakey, a stone wall. While newly minted two-year man Jordan Dawson refuses to drop a gear. We had it all on Saturday afternoon, even a possible season-ending injury to Ruckman Callum Sinclair. You are listening to the Swans Blog Swans Cast, the number one Sydney Swans fans podcast. In this week's episode, we review the Swans 15th round win against the Suns at the SCG on Saturday afternoon. We talk about Sinclair's injury, the improved performance, the good, the bad, the ugly, and give you our Sunday champions and villains. I'm your host, Justin, and with me is Swans Cast regular Josh. So uh, let's get into it straight away, Josh. Callum Sinclair, it's not looking good, is it? Ugly. It's the situation we've Jeez. been hoping didn't happen. Uh, we've yeah. been hoping this hasn't occurred for the last year and a half, and yep. now it's finally happened. And uh, the cupboard's still bare. Yeah. The cupboard is still bare for a it viable is. short-term alternative. So, yeah. And we've been battling with this since the start of last season. Sam Naismith went down with an ACL before the season started. Kurt Tippett retired from uh, an ankle injury and surgery. Uh, and Darcy Cameron was virtually untried until about round 15, 16 last year, and he was absolutely destroyed by Jared Witts and hasn't played since and is now injured. So we've got, we've got no option. Now, 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 that's right, now injured. But if you if you listen to uh, Horse's post-game interview, he actually has had a PCL injury since the preseason as well, which I don't think is anything that we had picked up before. So he had an injured PCL in the preseason. Um, was on, I'd suggest, limited game time. And then he popped a calf a few weeks ago, and that's finally forced him one of the sidelines again. So yeah, um, he actually has not been as available as we would have thought he was. No, and probably the really only saving grace in this situation is the fact that we picked up Michael Knoll in the mid-season draft. And, uh, you know, John Longmire was hesitant to commit to the fact that they might have to play him this week in the uh, post-match conference, Josh. Yeah, that's true. Uh, bearing in mind that if we do play him, he'll be probably going up against Zach Clark. <laughs> yeah. So it's not it's not all bad. Like it could yep. be a nice a nice way. Here you go, mate. Just see what it's actually like. Yep, um, exactly. But it's still not a good situation to be in, and it was something we really hoped they were going to rectify in the draft last year. And for whatever reason, it hasn't occurred. Their priorities obviously uh, were lying somewhere else. The irony with with uh, Noel though is that Essendon. We're very keen on taking Michael <laughs> yeah. Noll, and, and we instead we him. took him. Yep. So I know, and it would be. I I would like, like I think it would be quite funny if if we played Noll this week coming up against Essendon, and won. Oh yeah, I just think there's a delicious <laughs> irony in that. Yes, yes, and if he did play, and Zach Clark was playing. If he actually beat Zach Clark in the hit-out department, that would be sensational. <laughs> yeah, it'd be pretty good. Um, I tell you what, it's probably one of the only good things about being down at the bottom of the ladder at the time. I think we were um, 17th or 16th at the time when the mid-season draft came around. So we were lucky because we are only about three or four spots below Essendon that do- at that time. Yep, that's true. Uh, I guess what it comes down to in the end is Michael Noel ready. And is that the primary concern or is the primary concern keeping a lead down back where he should be? And read up front where yeah. he should be. Yeah, it, it's I, an interesting I think I'd play Nolan and just let him get beaten up. Well, it's weird because we don't have any depth in defense at the moment. Our next defender is Toby Pink. And he's not exactly setting the yeah, water light. Right. So he hasn't played yet. He hasn't played at all since he uh, was drafted by the Swans. And he was originally a centre-half forward who wasn't particularly good. And now playing as a centre-half back who's a bit better but still isn't particularly good. So... We really need a Lear in defence for this game, and we're just going to have to bite the bullet. Uh, the other option is Hayden McLean could come in and debut, but uh, he's yep. probably not even going to get more than six hitouts, if at all, lucky for the match. So, well, well, would you even debut him as a as a ruck? You'd probably stick him forward and put Reed in the ruck if you're going to do something silly like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And Reed has played games in the ruck before. He was doing it a couple of years ago. Do we want to do that? No. 
No, I, I distinctly what? remember his six goal game against the Western Bulldogs. He looked absolutely amazing. Within two weeks, he was playing like 80% time in the ruck and he looked utterly dreadful two weeks after his six goal haul. So, yeah, look, I've never been a fan of Reed Rucking because even though he can give you a reasonable chop out, he, he tends to get injured. His body doesn't seem to agree with it. Um, yeah. It's not something I'd like to see us do for the rest of the season. I just, I, I mean, my, my gut take now is just bring Michael Noel in and give him a taste of it. If he doesn't date, if he doesn't play seniors next year, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, he doesn't play seniors next year. Exactly. They've also got to make a decision on whether to recontract him at the end of the year as well. So, I mean, this is a good opportunity to decide whether he's worth recontracting. Yeah, I would suspect that he's probably ahead of Darcy Cameron in this case anyway, as far as contracts go. When he's come in to the NEFL side, he has played primarily ruck, and Darcy Cameron's gone back to playing basically forward ruck. And that was what he originally was when he played in the uh, in the Waffle all those years ago. I think it was about three, two, three, two and a half, three years ago now was he played as a forward who could ruck, not as a ruck who could play forward. So we've had this um, weird kind of tendency to take forwards who could ruck a bit and turn them into primarily players who ruck who can forward a little bit. Yeah, and it's not like he doesn't have decent sort of uh, pedigree behind him. He's very competent at the Sandful level. Yeah. So he's equivalent of a decent of a decent VFL level ruckman, yep. which I'm tipping is probably better than your average NEFL ru- level ruckman. And, uh, you know, in that uh, Waffle versus Sandful game earlier this year, he was best on ground for the Sandful team, and that's supposedly the best from the state in that team. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. You know, he's he's obviously got some utility. And and there were some players... Oh, my gut feeling is that they're going to play him. Well, there, there were some players from those teams who got drafted anyway. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, Josh DeLuca was one of them. Yep. He went to Carlton. Who else is in there? Oh, I don't I think... think- Another guy from South Australia. I can't, I can't quite remember the teams, but I know that there was at least two players from that game, except for Michael Knowles, so probably three players all up who got drafted from that Sample versus Waffle game. Yeah. And Noel looks like he could potentially be the first or second player to play if DeLuca hasn't played yet. I mean, DeLuca's already played in AFL football anyway, so I mean, that's a bit yeah, different. Yeah, when he was with Frio. Yeah, exactly. I've got a funny feeling that uh, Hayden McLean and Sh- and Mo- Shannon Noll, I was calling him Shannon Noll, Shannon Noll. and Michael Noll were actually what from the same club me? in the Sandful as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from the same club, Please I think. Please don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. From the same club, so... We've gutted um, that club. <laughs> they're not happy with They're us. not happy down there. There's a lot of argy-bargy about how there's no compensation for these clubs with the mid-season draft. Exactly. Stealing their best players. So, But we even um, took um, Hayden McLean after the draft. We took him in about February, I think it was, as a backup player. And it was a weird pick because it was uh, primarily a, just a, a depth pick because it never looked like we had any intention to play him. No, and, and we went out looking for a key defender as well. I wonder if they got him... It was a strange pick. I still don't understand what that was about. The only thing I can think of is they got him to put Toby Pink in defense and try and retrain Toby Pink as a centre-half back. And to Toby Pink's credit, in the Neafel, he hasn't looked that bad as a centre-half back. He's probably looked a little lower than what Lewis Malikin is, but with a bit more (laughs) athleticism. So I'm not saying it's a particularly high bar. It's not, unfortunately. But, I mean, there could be potentially something there. So, it's a kind of a wait-and-see prospect. He's a project player, Toby Pink. But yeah. Yeah, we'll wait and see. But I, I can't see Hayden McLean being on the list after this year if he's on a one or, if he's on a two-year contract. One or two-year contract, I can't see it being extended. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? No. So, uh, it's very much a wait-and-see what will happen with Michael Knoll uh, next week. John Longmire, he was a bit of a comedian in the post-match conference. Uh he said that he might call up John Worsfold, maybe have a gentleman's agreement to uh, only play midfielders in the ruck or go paper, rock, scissors <laughs> at each, each ball up. Flip a coin, Flip come a in coin. spinner. The problem yeah. with that is that the team we're playing the week after is going to go, no, mate. No. Yep. Yep. <laughs> play ruckman. <laughs> I wonder if they'll get Kerry O'Keefe's um, frog in a bank joke and do that every single time there's a bounce. But, yeah. Uh... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh well, who knows who knows that'll honestly. be interesting to see what goes on there yeah it will be look let's uh let's kick on with the review uh yep. so it was a fairly solid win despite the fact that callum sinclair went down with a shoulder injury very early on in the game i think it was um if you can count the first bounce as the first contest of the match it was his second contest of the match 
which was maybe like the fourth contest of the match. He just went down. Uh, Jared Witts was tackling him from behind. He went down on his side, arm outstretched, and the angle just popped his shoulder straight out. Uh, he got up. He was holding his shoulder. The commentary at the time, uh, they said basically it looks like a classic shoulder. Uh, there was the AFLW player from GWS. Can't quite uh, recall her name. She was a really good boundary side rider. She was absolutely fantastic, especially with the media Yeah, she was. She just basically looked at it and gone, yeah, that's a pretty typical shoulder. He's going to go off. Unlikely to return. Uh, he went off, got it popped in on the bench, had some time downstairs with the with the trainers and the doctors and got it strapped, very heavily strapped. I know that we were talking offline at the time, sort of scratching our heads going, why is he coming back on? <sighs> Five, six minutes after he came back on, he dislocated it again. Yeah. Look, it would depend on... Um... I guess it would depend on, on the motor assessment they would have done downstairs. So they wouldn't have just strapped him up and sent him straight back out, you would hope. But there are some kinds of dislocated shoulders that, that you're able to do that with. Um, and as long as they keep moving and it stays warm, they'll be okay. It's when they get cold and, and lock up, it becomes a problem. But clearly it didn't work with him, So yeah. it, which is a shame. Which is a shame. Uh, I doubt he'll be back this year. I... I I would hope that... Uh, look, if we make finals, we're making up numbers, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, realistically, that's where we're at. So We, we may get He's going to need but... surgery of some sort. Yeah. yeah. He's going to need surgery of some type. Get it done now. Let him heal properly, and then he can have a proper pre-season. If we hold on to him until the end of the season, then put him under the knife, it's a month and a half worth of recovery time we'll lose, and then that'll start eating into his pre-season. So. Yeah. And we do run the risk of doing more damage, and that was my point... Uh, and I know a lot of the uh, supporters and a lot of fans of the blog uh, in general were a bit like WTF at the whole Sinclair coming back on because there was the risk that he could do more damage. The very... F- yeah. And the thing that really surprised me was he came back on straight into the center circle and contested the next center bounce when he came back on. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, what the hell? And then he went up for the contest, barely got off the ground, was about a foot lower than the other guy in the contest, couldn't even get near the ball. He contested two boundary throw-ins, and in any case, he was like nowhere near bodying up. And then he's gone, okay, right, I'm going to give this a go. I'm going to try and wrap my arm around Wits at the next one, which was about two minutes later. And as soon as he wrapped his arm around it, the shoulder just popped out. Yeah, which is which is unfortunate. He'll need a reconstruction either way, so yeah. I don't know whether it actually is that big of an issue in the long run. Um, certainly seen plenty of you know motocross riders and jockeys and that kind of stuff in my line of work who come off and they pop their shoulder back in they ride the next race kind of thing so it's not an unusual thing yeah i wouldn't think but yeah wait wait and see i, I reckon we'll have an answer by the end of the week i imagine probably to have an answer by that by tomorrow afternoon yeah and it might be a case you know where the club tries to dose him up and strap him up and pray for the best for the rest of the season if yeah, they're going to well, do that, they have to play him in the forward line. They can't play him. Well, in the no, right that's again. A, yeah. That would be a situation that would really annoy me because we don't actually have anything to gain. We're not a premiership exactly. contender. Exactly. I I, well, I was baffled by him coming back on. I honestly thought that he should have just gone off, staying off, wrapped it up, get scans, deal with it. Don't try and risk more injury. I, I don't like. You don't know whether or not coming back on and popping out again has actually done more damage. It could have, it might not have. You, you, you never really yeah. know in this situation. But yeah. like you say, we're not contesting for the flag this year. We're barely even going to make the finals. And if we do, we're, we're probably going to finish seventh or eighth at best. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, as it stands, we're, we're a gaming percentage out of eight. So there is the chance, there is a very real possibility we can make finals. And we play Fremantle in a couple of weeks. And that could potentially be, you know, a, a game for a, a spot inside the top ten. But we're going to have to do it without yeah, Sinclair. No, that's right. And we're going to have to play the rest of the season without Sinclair if we're serious about getting him right for, you know, 2020. Yeah, no, that's right. Look, I I, look, I guess it depends on, on, on where you see what their end goals are. For me, since like round four, it's been, you know, well, this is the year we had to have. Here's the year of development yeah. we need. And I just, I see everything from the buy onwards as the start of next year's preseason kind yeah. of thing. So, um, and if we yeah. make finals, I'll be happy. But I have no expectations to do it. I just personally, as a fan, I just want to see good development of the team and then see what we can do with that next year. I don't see any any advantage in playing Sinclair at all for the rest of the season. Yeah, I, I agree. I, look, I feel I've already made my, my point clear in, on this, and we're yeah. certainly going to touch on it later. But uh, let, 
let's uh, kick on with the review, talk about some stats, and then move on to uh, what we liked and, and didn't quite like. Look, stats-wise, so the both of us said in the preview podcast that Jared Witz was going to win the Ruck contest, and he was going to win it easily, but it was going to be up to the midfield to try and win the clearances and the contested possessions. <laughs> so the stats, like, they're a bit weird. They're, they're lopsided in different ways. Like, it's, it's so, really... So we got everything we said was going to happen, plus more, because plus Sinkers more. didn't play the whole game. <laughs> yeah, plus more. Uh, I I raised the fact that disposal efficiency, we have to be good by foot. I mean, we, we were 71% and they were 62%. They were atrocious by foot. Uh, but the thing is, in the first half, they were way more efficient than us inside forward 50 but oh, the amazing yeah. thing is 26 to 66 hitouts, and they only had 11 more clearances, only one more center clearance. That's over the length of the game, though. Um, over the entire game, which is basically... They were well and truly up on us at quarter time, though. Oh, yeah. Actually, at halftime, we had nine more disposals. Our kick-to-handball ratio will go on 1.1 kick to one handball. That's how low it was. And Longmire said after the game, they had to change the way they were playing because they were handballing far too often. Uh, we had plus 7% disposal efficiency, two more inside 50s, 19 less hitouts, 14 to 33, uh, plus one hitout to advantage, uh, 10 less clearances, four less center clearances, three more contested possessions, 10 less marks, six less marks inside 50. We really dominated on that in the second half. Four intercept oh, yeah. possessions uh, and one more tackle. So, some of the better players was Robottom and Hewitt had five tackles each at half time. Dawson, 16 disposals. Rampy, Kennedy, and Hewitt, seven contested possessions each. And Mills had six marks, four of them intercepts at half time. He was amazing. He finished with nine intercept possession. I, th- I think with Millsy, we're. We're just starting to see what we had a couple of years ago out of him. The last two weeks, he looks like he's got his bit of his mojo back, which is really good to see. I wonder if it's playing alongside... Because when he played in 2016, when he came on, he was playing alongside Aaliyah and Rampy, right? And Grundy was kind of in and out. Richards was pretty much in and then out and then just out. And we had Harry Marsh and Jeremy Laidler competing for those last two spots, right? all for the last yeah. spot, right? Yeah, but he's was, had to develop more more initiative. Uh, yeah. He's not being directed as much as he used to. So he's growing yeah. into that leadership role that we probably all thought that he had. Um, some people see him as a future captain. Rampy can't run it all on his own down there at the moment. So no. those guys have to grow into those, you know, not necessarily leadership, but they've got to grow a certain amount of self-direction and self-confidence to make decisions on their own rather than being directed what to do. And yeah. I guess... It's taken half a season, but he's he's certainly got some of his mojo back. Well, it uh, I would say Dane Rampey's recent actions on the field certainly didn't escape the attention of the commentators in the first quarter <laughs> when, when he probably should have been penalised with a 50-metre free kick for uh, coming in late in a marking contest and just throwing the play to the ground. Yeah, It was a, it was a good old-fashioned Dane Rampey nuffy moment. He's, he's having a, <laughs> a laugh a minute every game now, so... Yeah, he's playing so well, but he's doing so many mental brain fades. It's, it's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he's having an interest. He's having an interesting year. He is. I I missed the first quarter yesterday because I was at work. I got home just like a couple of minutes before quarter time, so I watched the the replay this afternoon, and it was interesting that in the way that take the Sinclair injury out of it, but Gold Coast came in with a clear plan to drag us down, especially our midfield, yeah. drag us down to that their level and really use the superiority of wits over Sinclair to just make it a dirty game. You know, don't let us have the uncontested ball like we have had over the last few weeks. And up until halftime, they very nearly succeeded. Um, they were, yeah. It was an ugly game, um, but they were super competitive um, and they really forced us to cough up the ball. Um, we, we had some very some patches of very ordinary disposal and we had a few repeat offenders in that. I'm looking at you, Jones. You didn't have a great game this week. <laughs> and more yeah. importantly for me, or worryingly, they they really they <laughs> and this will be Stuart Jew, knowing that a lot of our guys don't like being roughed up. And it seemed to me they targeted Jones and they yep. targeted Parker. 
and they really brought out some undisciplined acts out of us. And I'm glad that we cleaned that up after half time because things got yeah. a lot better after half time. And I think that really reflected in the improvement in our stats by the end of the game. It did. And look, the uh, the Luke Parker indisciplined moment in the second quarter uh, when he gave away a free <laughs> kick is Anthony Miles. He threw Anthony Miles yes. to the ground at a ball up. It was just so odd. You, you don't see Luke Parker doing that. I think maybe he was just frustrated. Anthony Miles kicks a goal. It goes back to the center, and then immediately Luke Parker gets a clearance, and he just nails it long, and Ali is basically in the goal square and just marks it right in front of goals, yep. basically, and sn- goes back and snaps a goal. So he made up for it. He instantly made up for it. But silly moments of that generated two of their two of their what yeah. three or four goals in the second quarter. So there was that, um, and then there was Jones with the most brain dead fifty meter penalty, just running across. That was it. Just running, just running. across. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And, and sometimes I think, well, I mean, sometimes when you're coming up behind a player and, they, and they've and they taken a mark, that you can't actually see they've got the ball because all you see is the back of their shirt. There's no way Jones could have not known he had the ball. He was yeah. right in front of him. Yeah. And he still ran across there. And then looked surprised when they blew the whistle on him. <laughs> it's not the first time he's done it this year. I think he's already given away one or two 50-meter penalties for the same thing already this year. So yeah. I, I think um, that kind of... It kind of encapsulates his game. I think the very first contest he was in, which was the first ruck contest of the game, it uh, got tapped out by Wits, and then Jones had the ball off the back of the contest, and he's tried to take the man on, and he got tackled, and he should have been done holding the ball. We're talking three yeah. seconds into the match. He should have been done holding the ball. That is symptomatic of how he plays. He takes a game on, but he does it in such a brainless fashion that it's incredible that he doesn't give away about six free kicks a game and i've said before i even said it last week that in games where we're very flat-footed and we need someone to take that risk i'll back him in every day of the week but this week was not the game where he needed to do that and even in i think it was the fourth quarter he got done holding the ball he yeah (laughs) he was in a he was in a paddock (laughs) of space and he ran at the one gold coast player that was there tried to do the The tried to do the step around and got nailed and I was like, Jones, what are you doing? Like, why? <laughs> it was completely unnecessary to get Nail holding the ball, but he did it. Yeah. Um, so I just and he, I just thought that his game this week wasn't as good as his stats suggested, and that he needs to know, he needs to figure out when to play on and when to not. Yeah. And this week was a time to not not play on. Yeah. And that was something that certainly changed at the half time break because I'm not quite sure what the play on percentage was, but it was very high. Uh, the team was playing on quite often and Jones was playing on literally every single time he had the ball. Yep. Uh, so there was no control. Our marks, I think we only had like 30, 28, 30 marks at half time. Uh, so yeah. I- I'm just having a look. So it's 35 to 45 marks at half time. So yeah, it really wasn't good for us the way that we were playing the game because it wasn't the way we played over the last six weeks, which is take 80... 100 marks a game. Uh, in the end, we took 80 marks. We took 84 marks for the game, but, you know, Gold Coast still took more at 89. So, yeah, it's that game was not the game to play on. It was control because that's how Gold Coast were playing it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and they were harder at the contest than us as well up until hard time, and they, they forced us to overhandball it. Yeah. But they managed to generate better run on the outside than we did as well. Yeah. Thankfully, we were able to reverse that after half time. Yeah, we were. And, uh, look, I think that coincided as well with a bit of a shuffle and the personnel that was going into the midfield. So I know that yep. Jones was going into a few of them, Florent was going into a few of them, Rose, I think, was going into a few of them early. They changed it around so that Heaney started going in from the wing and, and chopping and changing from wing and centre. Parker and Kennedy were at every single contest when they're on the field, basically. Uh, yep. Robottom spent a fair bit of time in the midfield in the second half. And, and he looked good, too. He looked good, and he finished with good numbers as well. So he had a pretty good game. Yeah, and, and this is the sort of stuff that they have to try. And Robottom, he's a inside midfielder. He finished with 21 disposals, eight contested. Uh, he had a few turnovers, unfortunately. But he had a goal assist as well. You know, good mm. pressure acts. Uh, he had four stoppage clearances and one center clearance. And this is a guy playing his fourth AFL game. Eight tackles. You can't ask for more from a, from basically someone in their fourth game. Well, yeah, I was going to say you can ask for more than that because Georgie Hewitt had 12. <laughs> Yeah, but he wasn't playing his fourth game. <laughs> he wasn't playing his fourth game, I'll give you that. <laughs> Some more stats. Uh, in the end, uh, we were down a fair bit at halftime in uh, clearances, centre clearances, but we finished just one down in centre clearances. 
We had nine more contested possessions. We actually had plus four marks inside 50. We really turned that around after halftime when we were down six. So we were five to 11 at halftime and we finished 16 12. So that's uh, 11 to one after halftime. Uh, 13 yep. to seven tackles inside forward 50. And we turned that around big time in the second half. And we had six more inside 50s. So, um, you know, it was really impressive. Yep. Yep, was. I thought that there was a little bit of controversy around Ben Ronk coming in. Yeah. I think he more than showed why he came in. His pressure was good. He got us two, two snags. He looked fit. Like, he didn't look fit like that at the beginning of the year, did he? He looks like he's lost a couple of kilos. And Yeah. He's just got that fitness up. He was. He was quite dynamic. Uh, Alir Alir in the ruck. He didn't get his hand on the ball much, but, I mean, he did win his own clearance. Had a few inside 50s and kicked a goal. Uh, <laughs> he was pretty good. Uh, who else is there? Tommy McCartan had a, you know, considering he came in as a forward and then they went, yep. oh, at the two-minute mark, you're going to be centre-half back. <laughs> yeah. There's an amount of flexibility in our team I don't remember seeing for a long time. Yeah. It kind of reminds me a bit, we can go back sort of 2010 to maybe 2012, when we mm-hmm. had Ted Richards, Heath Grundy, LRT, who could play forward and back. When LRT in 2012 played primarily as a, a full forward who could go back in defence. And he famously did that in the grand final in 2012 when he went back in the last yeah. quarter. And he took like two or three intercept marks in front of um, Franklin and Roughhead in the grand final last quarter. So yep. I'm not saying that McCarthy's going to be able to do that. But it's good to see that flexibility and that players can actually uh, rotate and swap positions. So Jordan Dawson, uh, he was the standout user by foot. Of he all was teams. amazing. He was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, at one point uh, on the AFL match timeline, this is 10 minutes into the fourth quarter, the AFL page said that Sydney have 38 more effective disposals in Gold Coast for the match. Jordan Dawson, nah. 22 effective disposals. Isaac Heaney, 18. And Zach Jones, if you can believe it, had 18 effective disposals. So... His use by foot was plus 90%. It was nearly 100% by foot, which is absurd. He went at 82 yep. for the night. Uh, finished with a goal assist, more than 500 metres gained, and eight rebound 50s. That goal assist, when he sent that ball into, I'm going to say Heaney, but it might have been Papley, precision on that kick is something that I haven't seen a Swans player do for a long time. A legitimate, We have a, a player who can legitimately hit a pinpoint target off the boot. Yeah. And his handball to kick ratio is almost polar opposite to everyone else in our team. <laughs> yeah, he, he moves the ball by foot. He's, he's not a handballer. He's a kicker. And he, um, gee, I'm glad he, re, he re-signed for another two oh, years. Yeah. Oh, I was so excited to see that the other day. <laughs> he, he's, he's just, he's, he's exactly the kind of player we've needed for a long oh, time. Yeah. His foot yeah. skills are elite. Just elite. He's kind of playing that off the back flank kind of role, but he hit, he goes back in defense more. He even moves into the midfield to take some of the center bounces. Yep. He does, And he's he a legitimate it. overhead mark, and he's a good kick for goal if you push him down there as yeah. well. So he can play midfield, he can play forward, and he can play defense. So I remember when he played defense against Hawthorne, uh, I think it might have been like last year or sometime. One of the first times he came in and he played, and he was playing in defense against Hawthorne. I remember scratching my head going, what? the hell are they thinking with this? He's too slow to play, you know, back pocket yeah. defense. Um, yeah, he's not quick, but his endurance is elite. He's got elite endurance, and he's been absolutely sensational for us. Uh, it, it's just it's just really good to see someone who can use the ball so well. Yep, yeah. And we've got a few more as well in the future. Yeah, exactly. Matthew Ling is yep. a great foot, uh, user by foot, but he just has just been unlucky. Stoddart. He's a yep. good ball user by foot. So there's a bit there. And the other thing too with Dawson as well, before we move on to the next guy on the list, is that he played a lot of on-ball work as well in the knee full. Like he's a legitimate big-bodied mid as well when they throw him yeah. in there. We haven't done it in seniors, and I don't think we've played him that way in knee full this year at all. But he, he racked up some fairly decent possessions there, not last year, the year before in Rezzi. So he's a yeah. bit of an all-rounder. And he was basically one game off winning the uh, Neapel Best and Verist. He played 13 he games was. and came runner-up. Uh, yep. it was ba- every single time he played, he was basically best on ground. And he played in the grand final against Brisbane and was basically the best on ground. He didn't get the medal. He probably should have, and he definitely would have, had the Swans won and not kick like two goals nine in the last quarter. 
So uh, yeah, we're not going to talk about. Not going to talk about that. Now. Actually, no, we, we will talk about <laughs> no, that. No, no, because no, no. I blamed. Yeah. No, no, no. Jordan no, wait. Foot. It's it's relevant. Hey, you blame Jordan Foot, don't you? No, I blame James Rose for losing that game because <laughs> he was so selfish with the ball. And the reason I bring that up is that James Rose is not like that anymore. No, he's not. He is. He is not the selfish player he was a couple of years ago. I, I was in. I've been impressed with his incremental improvement over the last three weeks. He's still doing some of the um, slightly brain dead stuff, but it's not every single time he gets a ball. So he is showing a lot of poise nice. and a lot of confidence in what he's doing. Like the first time he played, uh, I think he actually just got lucky by the fact that half the team was injured and he was yeah. forced to play more game time. And he ended up, I think it was like six or seven disposals at half time, and he finished with about 20 at the end of the match. Yeah. So you, you come in and you're probably a bit nervous and whatnot, but I mean, he still played 75, 80% of the game. Uh, you know, did some good stuff. He had one goal assist, six score involvements, had a crack at goal himself. He's showing that he can actually do it and he, and he can survive at AFL level. Yep, no, I've been happy with his improvement. We've got Luke Parker. It, it's going to be a real toss up between him and Dawson, I think, for the uh, 10 coaches' votes and three Brownlow votes. Yeah, I agree there. And when it comes to the Bob Skill medal, um, <laughs> it's going to be hard pressed to split them. I think it's going to be real difficult. No, I think, no, I, I, no I, for me, I think Luke Parker at the moment is going to be the runaway fancy. And the reason I say that is that Jake Lloyd's going to suck up a lot of the votes for earlier this season. Yeah. Just because of the amount of ridiculous stats he was racking up, even though he was often not doing borderline anything with them. Effective, yeah. Anyway, yeah, Luke Parker, I mean, you can't really ask for more from him. Uh, his turnaround in the first six, seven weeks was pretty pretty ordinary. Yeah, it's brand low metal form, isn't it? It is. It's just seven weeks too late, really. Yep. We, we were having to chat about this offline, and I've estimated that he'd be on about 12 votes by now. He yep. has three best on ground in the bag. No question. I think he's going to get the three for this weekend. He's got three for round eight, and he's got the three for last week. Yep. I, I don't think that's even debatable. And then he's going to have at least three or maybe even four votes from the other games of one where he's been pretty good. He's the yep. runaway leader on the Swans leaderboard for the AFLCA, and he's our runaway leader for the Player of the Year votes, which we're going to touch on pretty soon. So mm-hmm. he's a mile in front. And he should be the runaway leader with, with this kind of stat line. So 31 disposals, 16 contested. 11 clearances, 6 tackles and 1 goal assist. Just another great game from him. It's just a shame he gave away a goal. Yeah. Fortunately, he made amends <laughs> like literally straight away. So He got his rage on after that, actually. So he did, yeah. It um, fired him up a little bit. It did. It did. <laughs> Josh Kennedy, the other skipper. Hey, am I the only one who feels like the magic's waning a little bit with Josh Kennedy? No, you're not the only one. I think it's fairly evident. Like I remember watching because it's him in, funny because like the first quarter, read out his stats in a minute. I know, but the first quarter he looked like a winger, almost centre half, uh, not a centre half forward, but a forward flank. Yeah, I, I just I, I don't know. I just feel like I just feel like that. You look at his numbers and you go, he's still having great games, but I just don't feel the magic this year. I don't know why that is, but he comes out of a game, so he's got twenty seven disposals, twelve contested, five marks, six core involvements, eight tackles, and seventeen pressure acts. And Which yet, I still feel good. like, <laughs> yeah. And yet, I still feel like that the just the magic's not quite there. I don't know why that is, and I've been feeling that way all year about him. I think it might be to do with his fitness, to be honest, because he he has had injuries, so he hasn't been the fittest he's ever been. And you know, maybe maybe that's what it is, really. Well, I I don't I don't know. I certainly certainly um uh, he's been quite the last few couple of weeks because of that knee, and then he had some time out for it. But yeah. I don't know. There's just sometimes I look at him and I just think, you know what, you wouldn't have done that two years ago. Or you would have broke that tackle two years ago. Or you would have gone the other target two years ago. So I I don't know. I just, I might be reading too much into things there. Well, fortunately, we've got George Hewitt doing a really good apprenticeship and he's basically ready to take the mantle in a year's time anyway. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. The next player we're going to talk about is Callum Mills. Uh, he finished with eight marks. Um, I know at least four of them were intercepted in the first half. I don't know how many of them were intercepted in the end. But he had 20 disposals and nine of them were intercept possessions. And he went at almost 90% disposal efficiency. His defensive work in that first half with Aaliyah, either off the ground or in a ruck, was absolutely superb. He helped Rampier hold down that defense. And he yeah. was taking on guys much bigger than him too and beating him. Yeah, 
and he really needed to rise to the occasion as well then. Um, and that that was good. Uh, I just, I've been really happy with Mills the last two weeks, that the way he's come back, he's showing us that form that he had uh, a few years ago. Last on the list is Isaac Heaney. Yep. Now, Isaac, for me, and I know I said this at least twice uh, the other day, he felt it felt like he was invisible for the first half. Like, it just felt like he was there and he got the ball, but I just felt like there were patches where he was completely invisible. And when he had the ball, he did not a lot with it. But his second half, holy mackerel. <laughs> yes. His second it half was, was epic. It, it was, was an epic, epic yeah. second half. So <laughs> he went from being invisible to being, hey, everybody, look at me. Look at me, yep. The only thing he didn't do was take a absolutely screamer mark. No, that's right. But, you know, the, the Volkswagen Beetle turned into the Rolls Royce again. Uh, and he had a, <laughs> he had a big second did. half. But So he finished up with <laughs> two goals. Uh, should have been three. Yep. Uh, 25 disposals. 11 contested at 88%. Uh, two goal assists, nine score involvements, 11 marks, and three inside 50s. Um, yeah. He yep. <laughs> finished having a very solid game. Uh, but just... And he he's just didn't seem quite right in the first half. Look, and I think he's a chance to even pick up a Brownlow vote, to be honest. Yeah. I was thinking about this after the game, and we certainly got a lot of feedback about people saying, oh, you know, what about Papley? What about Aaliyah? How come Heaney? The impact he had in that second half, especially uh, the third quarter when the game was on the line, he, he was one of the people, main people who changed it and influenced yeah. the contest. It was him, Parker, and Kennedy that really turned the match yeah, and the yep. fourth quarter was just he got what he got what he earned. He got two goals, should have had three, and he still had a pretty bloody good fourth quarter too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And we back right after this break. Welcome to intermission. Player of the Year votes. So, Josh, you want to give us uh, the five to one, please? Well, it's actually in the order we just read those best on out in. Um, so, <laughs> yep. coming in with one vote, we gave it to Isaac Heaney. I'm guessing we probably would put him a little bit higher had he nailed that third goal yep. and if he'd been a bit more consistent through the first half. But, you know, one vote for him. Two for Callum Mills for a return to form. And that might be the first time Callum's poll a vote this year with our player of the year i think you know it's second or third time but he he's not polling high and he's certainly not polling okay. high on the aflc either he's polling yeah. very low no he won't though. uh josh kennedy comes back into the lineup with three votes lukey park with four who's just edged out by jordan dawson and then you've probably got a couple of uh honorable mentions down there with papley and and Ali for standing up in an awkward situation and doing fairly well um, and certainly Nick flipped a coin Blakey as well yeah Nick Blakey, you could have flipped a coin for three, two, and one votes, um, and then flipped a coin again for for five votes and four votes. But yeah, exactly. Um, it was a tougher one to decide this week. It was uh, our leaderboard at the moment. As I said earlier, Luke Parker's the runaway leader. He's on thirty-two. Josh Kennedy, who was the big leader in the first six, seven weeks, uh, he's second on twenty-two votes. Alia Alia is on twenty. George Hewitt is also on twenty, and Jordan Dawson is coming in fifth place on fifteen. So, little O-Flo has been overtaken. Poor O-Flo. Champions, villains, and the good, bad, the ugly, and uh, that'll be it for tonight's show. So, Josh, you want to kick us off with your Sunday champion, given it is this time recorded on a Sunday night? It is recorded on a Sunday night, and it's not even close to being midnight like it was the other day. <laughs> um, look, uh, it was my Sunday champion. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, my Sunday champion is uh, not the fans of this club. Uh, because I still hate them. Yep, um, but the reincarnation of North Melbourne under East Shore, the job they did on the Pies this week was bloody amazing. They absolutely outworked that team. Uh, the Pies were horrible. 
Um, and I think I'm going to touch again on that later. But but what Reece Shaw has done with that team in the last month has just been outstanding. Yeah. And, and that was a legitimately exciting game. I've never been so excited watching a North Melbourne game. <laughs> it, it was just it was just a great game, a great effort. And so North Melbourne under Reece Shaw is my Sunday champion. Yeah, look, to uh, watch any team bet up on Collingwood, it's a, uh, it's a good game to watch. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I like it because I looked at the scoreboard early. I'm like, okay, this looks competitive. North Melbourne looked good. And then I looked at it after I did all my report and rating and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, it's the score. And you guys are raving about it. I'm like, what the hell is the score? Oh, shit. <laughs> What's yeah. happened here? Everyone's just going, oh, S-H-I-T. Uh, but uh, yeah, much, so. much like we did a little while ago when Carlton beat Fremantle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not changing my champion to villain after that, but oh wow, yeah, no, Mark Murphy, well done on that one, and I can't believe they won. Uh, goal for goal in the last two minutes. That was a. Uh, I've got to touch on that a little bit later on in in the good bad. And ugly, did it without but... Patrick Cripps. That's what made that oh, win so that outstanding. That was a massive, massive win for Carlton. Uh, but in any case, speaking of uh, North Melbourne. Uh, my Sunday champion is Nick Blakey, because he turned out North Melbourne. Lizard man. He took an absolutely epic hit from Jared Witts. I mean, that was colossal he got hit. He got creamed. Got creamed, man. Like, that would knock out most players. And he got up, danced himself off, went back and kicked the goal and stayed on the field. And you can always see Jared Witts' face afterwards. He's just depressed. He's like, what have I got to do to take this kid out? He honestly yeah. looked depressed. Not because he's. I wouldn't be surprised if but... Wits gets a please. Oh, we won't get a please explain, but he's probably going to get a little bit of a, a slap on the wrist. sanction from the MRO. Yeah, for it. yeah. But he looked like I've just tried to knock this bloke out, and he just kicked a goal over my head. What the hell? <laughs> so, yeah, he's a tough little bastard. He is, and Franklin loves playing with him. He's demanded that he has to play in the forward line with him. So yep. it's uh, it's good. I love it. Uh, Sunday villain. I'll kick it off. Uh, AFL goal yep. review system. It's been a Boo, ongoing again, again. again. There was God. like three instances on the weekend. Like there was one on Friday night, which was the Essendon GWS game, right? The yeah. Giants player's finger was broken. It was broken. How could he have not touched it if he didn't break his finger when it's bent back 90 degrees? What happens? Essendon win by six points. Now, they may yeah. have won it anyway because Giants would have got the well, they would have got the ball back. And they would have had to kick it out, and they were pretty ordinary at that time. But the ball was touched. Uh, then you go to it, the... It was Sydney, terrible non-call. Oh, it was a shocking call. Then you go to the Sydney um, Sydney Suns one. And I'm, I can't remember who the player was at the end of the match. Weller, I think it was. He kicked the goal, and it was a good goal. Uh, let, let's be honest here. It was a goal. And then they deliberated over it for a minute, over what looked like it could have brushed Lewis Malikin's arm. None of the footage was conclusive. The footage was absolutely trash, by the way. It was just blurry crap. Not to mention the fact that we missed Sam Reid's goal in the first quarter and we didn't even get a replay of it. In all honesty, just kill the system. It's garbage. It's trash. Just kill it. Either put the technology in or just kill it. It's a pretty ordinary, pretty ordinary situation, isn't it? If they think that they're bringing in an NRL-style bunker is going to fix it as well, no. well, just... The thing is, NRL <sighs> have their own video. They've set it up. They've done a, and they've they done still a get job. they still make horrifically incorrect decisions yeah, with course. the bunker as well. So yeah, anyway, moving on. Yeah, moving on. Please to your villain. <laughs> Sunday villain is Port Adelaide. Uh, they should Port be Adelaide really after. Read. Yeah, well, you know, after what was a pretty impressive win over uh, Geelong last week, they then dished up that garbage <laughs> against the Bulldogs. Um, yep. I don't know how Ken Hinckley's job isn't on the line these days. Um, he just can't get that team to perform consistently. And what must have really rubbed salt in the wound is that they, they got beaten by the dogs, especially around the stoppages. <laughs> and they've got a guy like um, they got a guy like oh, what was his name? Captain of the Lions. It just escaped me. Bloody oh, the pig, the pig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking uh, about. I know who you're talking about. Uh, we'll just call him the pig. Here. Tom Rockliffe. Tom Rockliffe. Oh, Tom who's Rockliffe. supposed to be a ball magnet, by the way. May he racked up 57 touches in a game in the Sandful this week. So, <laughs> 57 touches. So, yep. uh, you know, it, it was just, it was a it was a shocking game by them after what was a pretty good game the week before. So, they're my villain just for being Port Adelaide. Okay, time to move on to the good, the bad and the ugly. Oh, 
I'll kick it off, Josh. What I've really enjoyed this week has actually been the player takeover of the Fox Footy Channel. Yep, agree. Uh, your good, please. My good. Um, it was actually a uh, a podcast, um, not ours. Um, weird. <laughs> So uh, uh, the AFL does a podcast, a weekly podcast on the the road to the draft during the the home and away season, and this week they had uh, Simon Dalrymple on it, which and he's the um, the head of recruitment at the Sydney Swans. We linked it up onto the Swans Cast podcast page and onto the Swans blog page. It goes for about forty minutes. If you want a good insight into into Sydney Swans recruiting. Go go and have a look at it and have a listen to it. It's a really it's really good. It's really clear. They talk about a few things that are really interesting just to all Swans people. You know how the current draft class is going. How guys who haven't played a lot of senior games are, are traveling. So they talk about Stoddart and they talk about Ling. They'll talk about Blakey. They'll talk about the way they do some of their selections. It's just it's a really good insight into Sydney Swans recruiting. So if you're interested in that stuff, go and have a listen to that because it's a really really good interview. Yep, 100% recommend it. Okay, time for the bad. Uh, so my bad is really about the AFL season in general and the rule changes. Um, there's been you know a number of entertaining games, but I mean, how many are scoring high? Like the Carlton Fremantle game, it was a thrilling finish. It was absolutely boring me to death for half the game because it was just so slow and congested and literally nothing was happening. No scores being kicked. But it came to life in the last five minutes, and there was about four goals kicked in the last five minutes. But it didn't even get past 80 points. For me, the bad thing is, with the rule changes, almost every team is struggling to get 100 points. And every week, there was at least scores over 100 points, at least, you know, two, three, four times. You know, I'm looking I'm looking at this weekend of football. Once, two scores over 100 points. It was uh, Richmond 103 to 70 against St Kilda, and the Lions 107 to 74. Eight of 18 teams scored between 70 and 80, which is uh, you know that's ridiculous. And Collingwood scored less than 40. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Geelong and Sydney scored in the 90s. North Melbourne scored in the 80s. Five out of 18 teams scored over 80. So the real yep. changes had <laughs> the complete opposite effect. They have killed scoring, and to me, I, I think like. When people think, oh, it's been an entertaining season, have you really liked it? I, I say that to myself, and I go, not really. It's been a bit boring. And I think back, why? And it's like, well, because there's no scoring. No, but I'm almost as bored watching one team score 120 and the other, scheme, other team score 60 as well. So uh, yeah. if it's all one-way traffic, it does nothing for me at the same time. And it's, it's a bit interesting because some of the best games we've ever seen were low-scoring affairs, like... Who's going to say the 2012 grand final was crap because it was a low-scoring game? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's I mean, at least one hard. team, one team, us, went past 80, so you know. <laughs> yeah. It was still a tight game, though. Yeah. So it, I don't know how you, man, you make the rules so that it's a tight game, but it's relatively high-scoring. Like, I don't know how you do that. Um, I think... But certainly, yeah. certainly they've they pulled some stats a few weeks ago and said that that um, one of the biggest reasons why is simply that team's conversion rate from set shots is so much is the worst it's ever been, and yeah. that's where they're losing their scores from. So, don't know how you yeah. fix that. I think also teams are actually getting less scoring opportunities as well. If you look at the number of um, scoring shots that teams are getting, they're way less than they've been in recent seasons. So, hmm. uh, even. Geelong and, and West Coast and uh, Collingwood to some extent who have dominated, especially Adelaide. Adelaide in particular are uh, the big losers out of the rule changes. They were kicking 100 points regularly, especially Adelaide. Adelaide were averaging over 100 points for the previous three seasons. Their averages dropped down like 25 points this season already. And they've barely changed. Yeah, but their midfield's garbage this year. They can't win the ball. Well, they haven't really changed anything. That's the thing. They haven't actually, like, personnel-wise, they really haven't changed. They added Gibbs. And they moved yeah, but, on. Yeah, but they're not um, winning it. They're not winning it like they were. No, they're not. They're not winning it though, and they're not moving it well. And they got guys like Tex Walker, who should have been good for four to six goals a game, can barely get his hand on the ball. So yeah, it, they were they were a team like Sydney who regularly played either one extra at the contest or one behind the ball. Yeah, and they can't do that with a current setup. They just can't. yeah, I, I don't like six 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 for that reason. It it means like they wanted to stop people from parking an extra hot behind the ball to just cut off scoring. Well. I see, in my opinion, all that's done is actually wrecked. It's it's done nothing to 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 curb the scoring of 
of the the traditional high scoring team who's got a really really you know like a like an A grade midfield, but it's really shafted some of the lower teams in being able yeah. to defend a, a small score. So, it... well, speaking of uh, small scores, let's move on to your bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my bad's Collingwood. Um, look, Collingwood. Uh, they won last week, but Nathan Buckley in his post game really laid it down. He's like, that was a shocking game. Like we did not play well at all. We have to lift. We have to, you know, get back to what we were doing. And then they went and dished out that crap this week <laughs> against North Melbourne. And um, I should have made them my ugly, but I I've had a moment of weakness. So yeah, Collingwood is just bad. <laughs> hey, they were and in. I, at I legitimately time. felt sorry for Buckley this week. They were in at half time. They, they were less than two goals down. Uh, I didn't watch any of the match because I was doing all the um, post match. Yeah, they were the in it on the but... scoreboard, but they weren't. They weren't in it. They weren't if that in makes it, sense. That they, they were in on the scoreboard, but they clearly weren't the better team. So the moments I saw, it was basically camped in North Melbourne's forward line. Yep. And I, I saw bits and pieces throughout the match, like only a little fragments here and there. And every single time I tuned in, it was in their forward line, camped in their forward line. But you know, speaking of uglies, uh, I'll kick things off. Cricket World Cup. Now, ugly, why? Why might you say, well, you know, with it, with Australia at the top of the table, why might you say, is it ugly? While the hosts have been playing utterly disgraceful cricket up until recently, uh, we're currently recording, they're 23 overs in against India, and they're one for 164. They were, in fact, one for, <laughs> there were none for 160 and over ago, and going at, like, almost eight runs and over. Uh, their fabled 400 score, 400 plus, no one has reached it. Sure, they've got the highest score of the tournament at like 380, 390. But that was against uh, Bangladesh. And they've crushed the minnows. The only thing that they need for this Cricket World Cup is an island to chase down yeah. a, a, a record run chase and just embarrass them because they've been shit. Uh, Afghanistan almost beat Pakistan. Um, I say ugly because that would have been so epic to see that happen. Uh, look, there's been some good stuff, but there's some of the favourites have been absolutely dreadful. Um, Pakistan was shocking for the first four matches. South Africa have been uh, unbelievably bad, inexplicably, unexplainably bad. They have been dreadful. Uh, New Zealand, a um, pre-cut favourite, crushed, basically made to look you know second rate. And the guy playing the guitar, just sit down, mate. Stop playing the freaking guitar. So, yeah, it's um, there's some really good stuff and there's some really bad stuff, but uh, my ugly is a Cricket World Cup at the moment. Fair enough. My ugly, uh, it's funny that we started off talking about injured Ruckman. We're going to finish up talking about an injured Ruckman, <laughs> but it's not the same Ruckman. Yeah. And ironically, had those two Ruckman not been injured, they would have been playing against each other this week coming. Um, and that was the injury to Bill Chambers uh, in the Essendon game the other day. When he went off with that calf slash Achilles injury, he clearly wasn't fit. Um, and when you have a calf slash Achilles injury, yeah. they're not the kind of people who come back on and keep playing. And for whatever reason, after poking around at his lower calf and his upper Achilles, they then decided to send him back on, and then it popped proper. Yeah. Um, and then he went from being sore to being immobile, and it was an extremely bad look. Yeah. Um, well, he's, and uh, an Achilles like is basically a year off. Well, I don't know if it's an Achilles or not, or if it's just a low, a low calf, but calf strain, but... Whatever it was, it certainly got worse, um, and he went from having a limp to not being able to bear weight on that leg at all. So, yeah, I thought that was an ugly look, um, and then <laughs> Sinclair dislocates his shoulder twice in a game. So, <laughs> yeah, anyway, that was... I just thought the way the, I thought the Bell Chambers thing was ugly. Yeah, it really wasn't good. Uh, like they should have managed that a lot better. But you can also say the same uh, about you know Sydney as well, and that they should have been able to manage. Callum Sinclair a lot better. So I understand, like, I understand why you'd strap sinkers up and send him back on, though. It's not a good look, but it is something that can be done, that you can get away with, that is reasonably conventional. But yeah. I don't know anyone that thinks uh, when you're querying whether there's an Achilles involvement, whether playing them is conventional. <laughs> yes, or a calf. Mm. But, you know, they don't send players back out with hamstring injuries, do they? Well, actually, Jared Mavay kicked two goals on an injured hamstring a couple of years ago, didn't he? I think he was actually coming off the ground at that time, um, and he pinged it, and he just stayed on. He waved away the trainer and, and um, stayed on and then came off. Thank you, Josh, for coming on again. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back again on Thursday for the uh, Swans Cast Extra. 
Uh, you can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the tag of Swans Blog. We also have a second Facebook page, uh, the Swans Cast Podcast. Leave us a message, leave us a review, hit up iTunes, go and leave us a review. That's where we love it most. Until next time, Josh, go Swans. Go Swannies. Go Swannies.